Alright. Alright guys, let's bring it back in. I'm going to show a video and then we'll get going. All right. The rest of that video is just watching the tank explode again and again from different angles. Was that a bigger explosion than anyone was ex expecting? Cool. That's called a blevy, which is a boiling liquid evaporative vapor explosion. Um, I was looking for an image to put on this slide. I try and find relevant images to put on my introduction and conclusion slides. And I saw this image. I presume these acetylene tanks aren't full yet. Ah, oh, I should have said what gas is held in a tank that's like this. Doesn't matter. Um, they're acetylene tanks. But if you get relief valves from adjacent tanks pointing to one, towards one another, you can get a blevy. Uh, and it's something we talked about in industry. Cool. Let's talk about some first properties of liquids, they're fluids. They're things that you uh, are probably familiar with, but I want to just ground us in them. Um, I've got a kettle on stage as well. We'll use it in about 20 minutes when you start getting bored again. Uh, it's something to pep the pepper up. So we're going to just define some first properties of fluids. We're going to come back and do something similar later on. And so I want to just formalize um, how we're going to talk about properties. And the question is, how do we know when we fully describe the state of a fluid? The answer is in the state postulate, when you've got two independent intensive properties. So having said that, um, what does independent intensive mean? Um, so, and what does a property mean? So a property is a property if its value is independent of the path by which it got there. So if I measure the temperature in the room, then it could have been hot half an hour ago, and now it's the temperature it is. It could have been cold half an hour ago, and now it's the temperature it is. And the temperature will reading will be what it is, right? So that's a property. Temperature is a property, okay? What other properties can you think of? So things about a system that would be independent of the path which they took to get there. Go. Pressure is a property. So something might be rarefied or compressed, and now it's not. Thank you. Yep, good. Anyone else? Density is a property of the system. Who was that? Good. Density is a property of the system. Excellent. Um, here's the first little batch of them, and we'll do some more later. Okay? So pressure, density, and temperature, mass and volume, are all properties of a system. I've put them in two lists. All right. Can anyone explain to me what's special about the things on the left 
and or and how they're differentiated from the things on the right. It's in the title. The word is intensive and extensive, but what does that mean? Go for it. That's good. That's, that's, I will adopt that explanation. So for those who didn't hear it, the things on the left are things that are part of the material. So for example, with iron, the density of iron doesn't depend on how much iron you have. And that's true. Um, the things on the left are called intensive properties. Is that a question? Question, statement, stretch? Stretch. <laughs> um, if you've ever been to a house auction, it's like, you know, you've got an itchy nose, but you don't want to scratch it. Because you're like, you're buying a house now. Uh, like, was that an arm? No. Uh, right, the things on the left are intensive properties. So they're, they're what's internal to the material, okay? So if you've got a little bit of, let's use iron, because it's a great example. Actually, I want to use a fluid, sorry. If you've got a little bit of water, that water will be at, at pressure and a density and temperature, right? If you halve the amount of water, it's still, the readings are still the same. However, if that water had some mass and you halve the amount of water, your leftover bit will have half the mass. If you halve the amount of water, it'll have half the volume. Okay? So things on the right are extensive. They depend on the extent or the amount of a system. Things on the left are intensive. So they are um, independent of the extent of the system. Because what we need, according to the state postulate, is independent intensive properties. So we care that they're intensive, not extensive. Um, the units for this, what's the units for pressure? Man, I was expecting to use a surface, so I'm not as prepared. I heard pascals, that'll do. We'll use kilopascals um, for our things. Units of density, kilograms, yeah, cool, good. Kilograms per cubic meter. Units of temperature. Kelvin. Kelvin. Excellent. We'll use Kelvin a lot. We'll also use degree C because it, you know, that's what people use. Um, so you need to know how to convert between them. Units of mass. I feel like we covered it. Kilogram. And units of volume. Meters cubed. Volume, we, we use volume as a capital V with a strike through. Um, because we also use velocity and we also use specific volume, which I'll talk about now. So we need three Vs, so we strike through the volume. Um, that's there. Cool. We need intensive properties, but if we've got an extensive property, we can do something to make it a specific property, which treats it like an intensive property. So specific means divide by the mass of the system. So if you no, you've got, say you've got two cubic meters of air, that feels about right, and that weighs two kilograms, that seems to be all right, okay? So then the specific volume is one meter cubed per kilogram. Is that right? Yes, good. So we divide by the mass of the system, and there's other things that we want to divide by that. So these are some other properties we'll talk about later, but I just want to show that the capital, capitalized values are the extensive properties. They depend on the size of the system. When we use lowercase letters, we're talking about the specific properties of the same thing. So we've got volume and specific volume, internal energy, specific internal energy, and so forth. Um, so if we divide throughout by mass, we get the specific properties. So what is the, what is the units for specific volume? Yeah. Meters cubed per kilogram. All right. And you'll notice that specific volume and density have inverse units. And that's because the specific volume is just the reciprocal of the density. And we'll use specific volume, not density. So you'll, you'll read tables or you'll get information that's in density and you'll convert it to specific, un um, specific volume. And the units of U and H over there, energy and enthalpy, are joules, and then it's joules per kilogram. 
and entropy we'll talk about in week six. So we're getting close. So we've got independent, well, we've got intensive properties. We'll talk about independence in week three, but for um, gases, for gases, all the properties are independent. Yeah, they are, that's fine. So you can describe the state of a gas knowing only two things, and you're used to that in your ideal gas law, which we'll also do. So when we have two independent intensive properties is when we've completely described the state of the system, which means if you knew, for example, in this room, you knew the temperature and the pressure, which are easy to measure, then you can calculate the specific volume, which is density. Right? So we can calculate the density of air, knowing only two other things. Cool, there's our properties and their respective units. I've put density in, down the bottom on its own in brackets because we won't use it. We'll use specific volume. Where we're talking about density. I think you're all familiar with this from 1300, but I wanted to mention it. When we put a dot over the top of a property, it means differentiate with respect to time. So Q is total heat over the course of a process. Q dot is heat per second. W is total work output or input in a process. W dot is work per second um, and mass flow rate as well. So when you see that, you know what it's talking about. You should be familiar with that. Cool. Any questions come out of that section? It's fine if they do. Yeah, go. Yep. Yes. Good. When I said pressure and temperature are independent, yeah. don't they interact with one another? Yes, they do, and we're going to talk about it. But at the point that you measure them, they, there's nothing locking them together. So they're independent in that sense. Yes. Good question. Cool. We will chart processes. It's just linked to the previous concept. So we'll chart processes on two-dimensional charts throughout the subject. So I wanted to introduce that very briefly as a concept, I'm carrying it. Because if you know two things about a substance, you can locate all of the other properties, all right? If we have a chart, in this case it's pressure and temperature, right? Pressure and temperature. If I have a PT chart, we would call this, right? Vertical, then horizontal, and I put some point on it, assuming these were labels, you know, the axes were labeled. Knowing the pressure and temperature, now I can know the specific volume, the internal energy, the enthalpy, and the entropy um, of that substance, okay? So it's really useful to be able to do this. So on two axes, we can chart things. So a 2D graph is all that we need to describe the state. So we'll talk about PT charts. We'll talk about PV, specific volume do temperature specific volume, and later, after we've introduced entropy, we'll do a lot of TS <coughs> charting. And for a chart, we'll have points. So typically you have a point on a whiteboard, it looks like a cross, and we'll give it a number, we'll call that a state. So at state one, that's what the fluid was doing, and then it went over here, and this was state two, and we draw arrows, and we might even Go back to where we started. So you'll see a lot of those. Um, and when you've charted in one set of 2D axes, you can then take that and chart, because I know what the entropy is at that point, I could easily chart this on a TS diagram instead, for example. So each of those points, represents a unique point on here, so I can transfer between different charts. So, just something worth being aware of. Cool. This one's a little bit more, just thinking about it. What? Temperature is a funny concept, because everyone knows what, like, people on the street know what temperature is, right? They're often wrong um, when it comes to understanding what it means and how it works, 
but it's both like really simple, we use it all the time, and very complex, uh, and I'll only tell you lies about it because the truth is more complex than I can even cover and more complex than we need for what we're doing. The bead on the left is blue and the one on the right is purple. My question is, so 20 degrees and 80 degrees, what's happening four times more to the bead on the right than is happening to the bead on the left? Like, what does it mean? Collisions? That's good. Velocity is, is very close. Kinetic energy, because it was on the last slide. But no, it is. It's kinetic energy. Who said that? I just want to eyeball you. Oh, there you go. Okay. And what was your name? Chris. Chris. Thanks, Chris. It's kinetic energy. All right. No one's picked me up on the thing that I really want to be picked up on. Go. Love it. Thank you. Because not four times more. That's, I'll pay that. Um, because it's meant to be in Kelvin. You know, it's like 1.2 times more. But the question still arises. So converting between Celsius and Kelvin, I like this particular diagram because it also includes Fahrenheit, just in case. And the idea is a ranking temperature scale, which is Fahrenheit with an absolute zero of zero. Um, so it's what Kelvin is to degrees C. Ranking is to Fahrenheit. Um, so it should be, ah, those should be Kelvin. I want to put this up. This used to be covered in advanced thermo. I'm teaching advanced thermo now. I don't know how much I'll put in it. <clears throat> There's a thing called a Boltzmann constant. So if you had atoms, so if you had atoms traveling in space, all right, then their kinetic energy, half mv squared, right, so the mass of atoms is quite small, okay? Velocity squared, thermal velocity, is three on two Boltzmann's constant times the temperature in Kelvin, okay? Which means that there's a velocity that atoms had. So if, if everything in the room was atoms, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what's more complex than atoms, then all the particles would be zipping around, okay? And as they hit you, they're transferring some of that energy to your skin or any surface, any surface in the room, right? And that's providing temperature. So temperature is a measurement of kinetic energy as it relates to gases. In solids or liquids, it's the movement between particles. It's vibrations, it's the extension and contraction of the atomic bonds between particles. And this becomes important when we start thinking about boiling and melting. Um, but for gases, you can think of them as having a velocity and it's about this. And Boltzmann's constant is a universal gas constant, which is about eight, divided by Avogadro's number, which is about six times 10 to the 23. So eight divided by six is about 1.25. It's obviously eight point something. Um, 6.23, and you come out with this very small number. What that means is, so say you take nitrogen, for example. Sorry. Good. I didn't have it. I did the calculation on nitrogen. The nitrogen in this room is traveling at, you want to give, give it a guess. How fast does nitrogen at 20 degrees C travel? If I said 100 meters a second, is it more or less than 100 meters a second? More? Go. I don't know, okay. 500? 500 is pretty close. It's about 460, right? So um, that's fast and that's hitting you all the time. And that's, um, that's what temperature is. Uh, interestingly, so the speed of sound, so for sound to propagate through a gaseous medium, right? It needs to be transported by something, right? So your speed of sound is lower than the thermal velocity. So in hotter gases, sound travels faster. And that, that's some of the transport mechanism that allows that. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. 
Temperature then only makes sense at a macroscopic scale. Like I said, if we were tracking each atom, we would track their, their velocity. The velocities are a little bit lower than that, and it's because they're not individual atoms. By the time you've got N2, you've got two atoms, and they'll, some of their energy will be represented in moving further away from each other. Some of their en energy will be represented in spinning around each other. Right? So not all of it is linear kinetic, um, kinetic energy. Uh, but we don't talk about temperature of individual atoms. We talk about temperature of systems and larger things. Um, and yes, thermal velocity assumes translation is the only degree of freedom, which isn't true. Um, and certainly the more complex the molecule, the less of their energy is in linear translation, the more of it is in, inter in intermolecular bonds and stuff. Anyone, uh, any thoughts, comments? Question's great, good. Let's boil a kettle. I've got a timeline. How much water did Harsh put in the kettle? <coughs> Let's see, I can't break this. This is my kettle from home. 1.5 litres. Good -o. we should write that up. How long will a kettle take to boil, is one question. And how long will the kettle take to boil dry? Think about it. Talk to your neighbour, have a little bet, right? So it's how long will it take to, to boil? And I'm not going to boil it dry, but I'm going to boil it down till there's only a little bit of, you know, liquid in it. How long will that take? So the volume is one. Commit, write it down, write it down, yes. Good. That sounds relevant. Uh, I, I own a power meter and I checked. <sighs> you too are becoming an engineer. That's a good question. Good, okay, you got something? Excellent, let's check it out. Oh, who's timing? You are. Okay. Add 10 seconds to your measurement. <laughs> Go. Good. Cool. Uh, now, they don't boil dry. They've got a pressure switch in them that turns them off. So you bypass it. Um, if we were in advanced thermofluids, oh, I should do this next session. That would be awesome. We would talk about the humidity that's adding to the room and where does the water vapor go? Because, you know, um, but we won't. While that's doing its thing, we'll talk about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. How many laws of thermodynamics are there? Someone said four. Well done. There's zero, one, two, three, and three, sorry. So there's four laws of thermodynamics. The, the highest law is the third law. Um, everyone's looking inside, that's fine. Someone's going to tell me when the kettle boils. The reason we have a zeroth law is we had a first law which we thought was the, the most fundamental thing going on. First law of thermodynamics. Then we came up with the second law and then someone said, actually there's something more fundamental even. Um, so we had to go back to zero in the 70s. Have a look at these dates. Um, I was asked last year, how do you keep, I, I'm a teaching academic, so I don't research. Um, and they said, how do you keep your teaching like fresh and cutting edge in line with the, in light of the fact you don't research? Because, you know, researchers are making new developments in their field and so forth. Um, and I gave an answer and didn't like it and I didn't get the promotion. Um, but, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that part. But, um, one the problem that I have in the field of thermodynamics, at least, is there's lots of cutting edge stuff going on, and you guys need to know about, uh, we don't even cover the third law, right? So everything you learn was developed before 1900. If you think about what science has done in the last 100 years, 
in our understanding of atoms and how things work at the micro scale, right, most of the devices that we use in the real world engineering applications, we're using science from over 100 years ago. I think that's crazy. When we talk about entropy, we'll, we'll talk about entropy and the numbers associated with entropy, right? People were measuring entropy before we had an accurate model of what atoms look like. And entropy is about atoms and the uncertainty of their placement and so forth. Um, engineering is often talked about as being the application of science. Actually, engineers do stuff way before scientists come up with it. We're like, sure, look, water boils, let's use it, let's work with it. And then someone comes along 50 years later and says, oh, by the way, you know why water boils at the temperature it does? Water boils much higher temperatures than it should and takes more energy to boil than it should because of some dipole stuff, there's some Van der Waal forces. Um, but we can measure it and use it long before we understand it. Um, anyway, that, that wasn't a planned rant. It's just a thing. So the zeroth law is about temperature and about ther thermal equilibrium, which if you think about it, with the difference in materials, right? So you've got air, you might have liquid, you might have wood, plastic, and that's, I think it's steel. I googled steel block. Um, that's what came up. They're different densities. They're different molecular structures. But if you put them next to each other and you don't get any heat transmission from one to the other, the thing you know about them is they're at the same temperature, right? So this complex thing that's hard to define and might be related to uh, velocities, we might have a problem. But anyway, that's fine. Um, is somehow the thing that when you put materials together, they transfer heat until they're at the same temperature. The zeroth law of thermodynamics says that if the temperature of object A is the same as the temperature of object B, temperature of object B is the same as the temperature of object C, Boiling. Time? Four minutes, 23 seconds. Cool. Who thinks, Mario, so let's put eight minutes out here. Who thinks the, coil, the uh, kettle will boil dry nine minutes? Less than nine minutes. More than nine minutes? Exactly nine, more than nine minutes, good, good. How much more than nine minutes? 10? That's fine, but you've got it written down. So you can update your estimate, right? If you thought it would boil dry in under four minutes, update your estimate. It's fine. Um, when will it boil dry? That's fine. It's going to be awesome because I'm going to start sweating because of the humidity. Uh, I should have asked Harsh to put less water in it. That's okay. So, zero with law, if temperature of A is equal to temperature B, Temperature A is equal to temperature C, then temperature B and C must be the same. So this is why they thought that's more fundamental, even than the first law. Um, and it's trivial in your experience of the world, but when we start talking about like, what heat is and what temperature is, um, it's actually quite fascinating that that's the thing. Um, that's how it works. What attribute of liquid Let's us measure temperature as a length. Someone who hasn't spoken before. Go. Thank you. I feel like we've met as well. Okay, no worries. You're wearing a similar shirt. And what was your name? Andon. Thanks, Andon. Anon. Anton. Thank you. My apologies. Thanks, Anton. Right. So liquids expand as they um, as they increase in temperature. And that lets us measure the temperature. But what makes this work, right, is what you're interested in is the temperature of the air. What you're measuring is the thermal expansion of a liquid. So you're relying on the fact that the air is warming the glass, the glass is warming the liquid, and the liquid is what you're actually reading. That's zeroth law of thermodynamics stuff. So we'll assume it. We'll use it. I wanted you to be aware of it. Thoughts, comments, questions about the zero law of thermodynamics? Yeah. It's 
It's a good question. So the question was, what about the expansion of the air inside the thermometer? I'll bring up a picture of a thermometer. Any answers to that? Sorry? Assume negligible? No, the gas will not have negligible expansion. Yeah. Oh, I'm standing next to a boiling kettle. It's in a vacuum? That's what I think as well. I think that it's a vacuum above the liquid level, but it wouldn't have to be, and there's a reason. Yeah, go. You don't have it open to the top. You'd, you'd contaminate the alcohol that's in there. No, it is a sealed system. It is sealed. Yeah, go. No? Stretching, scratching your nose. Can I see 370? Yes. <laughs> Gases are compressible. That's, so my answer is either it's in a vacuum, so, that, so they're manufactured in a way that leads a vacuum at the top, or it doesn't matter because your liquid will expand with much greater forcefulness than your gas will expand and, and will force the gas to compress. Um, that would be my answer. Yeah, go. Yes. Yeah. And you, you can adjust the scale to say whatever is true with this thermometer would be true. But it looks pretty linear, and it would be pretty linear. If you, um, if you put water in a bowl and you measure the water level, and then you change the atmospheric air to like five times what it should be, the level in the bowl would not move. You, could not, you couldn't detect it. We can do the, you can do the maths on that. Um, but that's called bulk stiffness, I think. It's like Young's modulus, like E. There's a, um, a property called G, which is a relationship between Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. And it tells you that things with a high stiffness don't compress. Cool. I, um, I spoke faster than I intended. You okay if I cover some more content? Because I want to smash through stuff. Is anyone surprised? Like, who said more than 20 minutes? Oh, no. You might be right. I didn't do the math. Um, we might not see the, it might see the, the kettle might see the lecture out. And I have to leave the experiment running. For the, next, um, for the next person. What I'll do, <laughs> I'm, sure they'll, I'm sure they'll be happy when I explain it to them. Um, I'll transfer over some more lecture content. Talk to the person next to you. Um, actually, can I, can I run something? Are you, this is a little bit intimate. Do we, do we know each other well? If you don't know the name of the person next to you, just meet them. Um, and we'll see. Would you, would you be willing to look the person next to you in the eye for like 30 seconds at close range. It's quite, it's quite intimate. All right. Okay. Check this out. I, pro I promise this will be fun. If you do this, it'll be fun. If you don't, people around you will have fun, and that's fine too. All right. No, we're not going to get there. All right. Good, let's do it. All right. That's awkward. All right. Thanks, guys. I will, I will run, a, I'll run a thing next week, all right, that involves looking at the person next to you's eyes, and it's such a trip out um, for reasons that I'll have to explain when we get there.
just the, the more content we can do now, the more we can spend in week three talking about something that confuses everyone. So let's smash it through. Um, ideal gas equation, you did it in physics. Everyone did physics as a prereq. You did the ideal gas equation. Good. Good. Re no or yes? Good. Excellent. My question is, what's the mass of the air in the room? All right, and that's something that we would use the ideal gas equation to calculate. Um, and we'll get there. And what's hap what would happen if we could seal the room, which would be difficult, um, and increase the temperature by 10 degrees? So what happened to the pressure in the room uh, if we did that? That's our question. Ideal gas equation, PV equals MRT. When or for what substances is this equation invalid? Good. Yes. Can anyone put that in? Yes, go. In an open system is the, is the conjecture. Actually, the equation's still valid in an open system, although your mass might change between state points. So yes, your normal use. So to answer this question, sealing the room and changing some properties, yes, it would be a closed system. So if the mass changes for between state one and state two, you need to update it, but it's still valid in an open system. Yeah, go. It's invalid when the substance is not monatomic. No, we still use it, we use it for atmospheric air, even though atmospheric air contains nitrogen and oxygen, carbon dioxide and some other stuff. So no, good thought. Yeah, go. Change of state. Where there's a change of state. Oof. Yes, but I'm using state to mean something different. So what kind of state do you mean? Liquid to gas. Liquid to gas, absolutely. Yep, good, and that's along the lines of what you were saying as well. So the steam coming off this, all right, I can't treat that steam as an ideal gas because it's close to its um, condensation temperature. All right? But I can treat atmospheric air, I can treat oxygen and nitrogen as ideal gas because they condense at cryogenic temperatures. Um, so where the temperature or pressure of a system is um, close to a, um, to a change of state, then it's not valid. Thank you. Uh, this one. So for the ideal gas assumption, which is what you did in physics, and we use it here as well. We'll talk about some modifications to it, but we'll use it here as well. For the ideal gas, assumption, we assume there's no intermolecular forces. So we assume that everything's just like spheres and they just bounce off one another, perfectly elastic. No attraction as molecules get close together, which is what they do. They attract to one another. Um, we assume that they all bounce perfectly elastically. And we assume they have no size, which is generally true. So in this room, you could say the oxygen and the nitrogen have very little size compared to the volume of the room. The volume fraction taken up by the atoms is quite small. But for a liquid or a solid, the atoms are butted up next to one another. So it's not true for that. Yeah, go. Uh, what sort of answer is this to the fact You don't? Uh, no, I'll put them up. Sorry. Yep. Because I wasn't intending to get to this, this concept yet. Sorry, I see you using a surface, so you're probably marking up by hand. Great, I'll put them up this afternoon. Good. Um, so it's not true for a liquid or, or a solid, but there must be some transition between when something's a liquid and it's not valid, and when it's a gas and it is valid. So we say this works when gases are hot, and that's a high temperature with respect to their boiling temperature, and low pressure. You can pressurize something to the point that this starts becoming valid. And the reason for that is, at increased pressure, you've got more atoms in the same space, your volume fraction of atoms starts to become significant enough that it affects your calculation. Breaks down close to saturation temperatures and pressures. What time are we at? Uh, almost 16. 16, we'll keep going until 20. Then we'll turn it off and we'll measure the volume and we'll calculate how long it would have taken to boil. Um, 
This is the ideal gas law as you've seen it. We'll use this. Anyone seen PV equals MRT, N, NRT, N for Nelly? Yes. We use MRT, M for Mikey, right? Um, and then we just change the universal gas constant to be, or the gas constant we use is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of the gas. So we take our 8.3 and we divide it by the, by the molecular mass. So for example, the R of nitrogen gas, so someone writes down 8.3. This is a periodic table of the elements with the things in white being things that are normally gases. Mercury and bromine are, are liquids at standard pressure and temperature. So if nitrogen has a molecular mass of 14, what's its, the R value that we would use for it? So we said R equals Anyone got a calculator can do that for me? No, it wasn't a hand up. Hey, DV 14 and 7. Yeah, go. Should the molar mass be? Yeah, probably. No, no. Oh, it's diatomic. Sorry. Nitrogen exists as N2, as we're talking about it. Anyone? 8 divided by 30. Let's see. Zero point? Two nine, who was that? Good, thanks for that. Good, oh. This is a table from your textbook. Can we call that a bad catch, not a bad throw? But it was, it's on the first row, so it's not a great throw. Um, there's our nitrogen, 28. Well done. And, uh, and 0 0.297 nitrogen. The one, so this is a table from the, from the back of your book, table A1. What's special about the substances I've got arrows pointing towards? They are? That's fine. Where do you find octane? Where have you heard the word octane before? Petrol? Yep, good. So octane is a substance that exists in petrol. Octane is normally a liquid at standard pressure and temperature. So is water vapor, well so is water, H2O. And butane is kind of on the limit. Um, butane is what uh, you've got in little butane lighters that no one has anymore because no one smokes. So you don't need to compress butane very much uh, for it to become a liquid. So these are examples of where it's risky to use the ideal, um, ideal gas law to do calculations with those things. Um, where they exist in solution, so assuming it's not condensing too much on the ceiling, all right? The water that is boiling is going into the air and is going into solution with the air, so the molecules are staying in air. That's what, that's what this is talking about. So this is talking about water as it exists um, in a vapour form. So PV equals NRT is what you'll probably learn in physics um, and it works. PV equals MRT is what we use and we use a table to look up the R value rather than remembering it. Um, if we divide both sides by the mass, so we're trying to make things from extensive to intensive, okay, we get specific volume on the left and we drop the M from the right hand side. So we use that a bit. And we can also take things in a rate sense. So if you've got flow, so in changing with time, you can differentiate the volume and the mass with respect to time. So, anyone want to guess 
how much, how much mass is in 2,000 meters cubed? What's, what's the approximate, de what's the density of air? Sing it out so I can hear it. I've got a boiling kettle close to me. What's, what's the density of air at standard pressure and temperature? 1.2. Well done. Per meters cubed. So 2,000 times 1.2 is about 2.4 ton. So there's about 2.4 ton of air in the room, which might surprise you or it might not. If you were going to heat the air up, okay, so my follow-up questions was, what would happen if you seal the room and increase the temperature by 10 degrees? What's our time? 22 minutes? Cool, it's kind of arbitrary. 23 minutes. I started with 1.5. We're down to 0.5. So we boiled a litre of water in that time. As an extension exercise to take home, how, if it's 800 watts of electricity, how much energy does it take to boil water, to turn water from 100 degrees C into steam at 100 degrees C? That's my question. We'll answer that in week three. Um, what would happen if we sealed the room and increased the temperature by 10 degrees C? If we wanted to seal the room and increase the temperature by 10 degrees C, a question we might ask as engineers is how much energy would that take? And to calculate that, you'd need to want to, or you'd want to know how much mass of air is in the room. Because the more mass of air, the more energy it will take to heat up. How long would that take? So we all generate body heat. Was anyone born after the matrix came out? Serious question, no. But like next year's cohort will, might be born, no, because so, you're not first years, my apologies. I think next year's first years are born after the matrix came out. I watched it in high school, um, late high school. <laughs> um, my my tie-in is people generate heat and that heat is energy, and the matrix, and they capture that energy. I don't want to spoil it for you, if you haven't seen it. How long would it take to heat the air up in the room is a question we should be able to answer. Really? Give me two minutes. Give me two minutes. Sorry? Oh, is that five minutes behind? Oh, that's, it's three minutes too. You've, if you've got midday class, you've got to go. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming. Sorry about the technical issues at the beginning. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Thanks, guys. Oh, that's generous. That is generous. Thank you.